For our practicing pivoting problem, we're going to look at customer satisfaction from airline data, an industry absolutely famed for its rock solid customer satisfaction. We're going to take that Kaggle dataset that you can see and load it in. It is an Excel data sheet by default, that's what it comes with. And to load that in using Pandas, you will have to have XLRD installed and you can install that using pip install XLRD. If there are any issues, don't worry, I've loaded it in and saved it back out to CSV. You can see it's the very first thing I do in the code here. So if you do have issues, change the read Excel into a read CSV and you'll be all good. So we're going to try and do four different things. The first is we're going to reformat our data just a little bit because satisfaction is currently not numeric and so many more, so many things are easier when they're numeric. We're going to pivot to show the average satisfaction based on gender and class figure out what's most correlated with satisfaction, and then figure out if the online features are correlated in count. And I'll get onto what that means when we get down there. So to start with, we have our data set here where you can see satisfaction V2, V2 for some reason, I wonder what V1 was. Maybe it was a number and like damn them for taking that out. But satisfaction is currently a list of satisfied. Great, it will have other things in. We'll get to that in just a tick. You can see that class is economy, business. There might be other things. We'll also get to that in a tick. And if we come down here and if we run df.info, which you can see I've already won, <laughs> one run, you can see we have around 130,000 entries. And luckily for us, pretty much everything is filled in. There are very few null objects, that is not in numbers, with just a couple down here in the arrival delay in minutes, but that's almost a completely negligible amount. Okay, so the first task that we have is to make satisfaction v2 numeric. At the moment, it's not, and that's annoying because it's hard to work with strings. So if we have a look at what we do actually have, we can go df.satisfaction underscore v2, and then just call unique on it to have a look. And we have a great huge two array, satisfied and neutral or dissatisfied. So I wonder now whether or not the original satisfaction V1 might have had three columns, satisfied, neutral, and dissatisfied. And for some reason I've bundled them together, but it doesn't matter, we can work with it. In fact, it's quite simple for us to do. All we have to do is map satisfied to let's say a one and neutral or dissatisfied to a zero. And we can do that explicitly. We don't need to go through and define these things as categoricals and define a sorting order. No, 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 there's only two of them. So it's simple. We just go satisfaction, we'll go to a one and then neutral or dissatisfied. And because I'm lazy, I'm gonna copy and paste as all good coders do. And we'll give that a zero. And then quite simply, if we just go DF and then we put in satisfaction, we can set that equal to df.satisfactionv2.map and then pass in our mapping. And now if we have a look at what df has right down the end, all the way to the right, let me scroll down there. We now have satisfaction, which is a zero or a one. Hmm, did I spell this wrong? Satis, ah, right, wasn't satisfaction, it was satisfied. Run that again, come down to the last column. We now have a great list of ones or zeros. So the next thing on our agenda is to look at the satisfaction based on both the gender and the class. And obviously you can break this down into whatever way you want. I just picked gender and class because that was interesting to me. Feel free to branch out and do whatever you want. And we're gonna go df.pivot table here. And we want to say that our values was what we're looking at. Well, that's obviously satisfaction. Whoops, and it'd be better if I could spell, but uh, you know, it's not gonna happen. Uh, the index, that is what are the rows, we'll put down as the class, and then we'll say, okay, the columns are equal to gender. And of course, you could pick more than one thing for all of these, right? You could pick two or three and you just get a hierarchical, that is a multi-index, same thing. And let's see, we want the ag funk to be mean, which is, you know, pretty much what it always is by default, but it's always good to specify these things. So if you come along and read it later, you know what's actually going on. Great, so here we have the pivoted class versus gender average satisfaction. So it looks like men are simply unhappy with life. They are more dissatisfied than women, regardless of class, only 20% of men say that they're satisfied with their economy trip. And I mean, I'm, I'm pretty unsatisfied with economy trips. Uh, I don't know whether that's a gender thing or whether, you know, I just hate those tiny, tiny, stupid seats, but I digress. 
One thing that we should be careful of when we look at these sort of means is perhaps we have low number statistics. Now we did this before, we did df.info and we saw that we have over 100,000 results. So that's not really gonna be the case in our data set. But to be sure, what we should normally do when you're looking at something like a mean and you're trying to figure out, you know, is this correct, uh, is to look at the count. So the more entries you have that make up this average, the more uh, certain you can be that the results are representative. Or in a statistical sense, the smaller the uncertainty on that mean is. It's actually a function of the square root of the number of entries. Uh, this is the... <laughs> This is something we won't go into. Uh, we're talking about the central limit theorem and a few other things. That's in a statistics course. And here you can simply see that if we had, let's say five or 10 entries, we might you know, scratch our heads and we can't trust this number too much. What if it's a fluke, right? If you flip a coin five times, you could get all heads. That doesn't mean that the probability isn't 50-50. It's just something that can happen. And here we have thousands of entries no matter where we are. So everything looks good. We can trust these numbers and we'll move on. What we want to do in the next section is to figure out what is most correlated with satisfaction. And this is something that is, again, easy to do so long as you know the functions. And df.core will give you back this giant matrix with everything correlated with everything else. But we don't care about everything, right? We care about satisfaction. So if we just pull that out and then also call, call sort values to make it even easier to read, you can see that some things are negatively correlated with satisfaction, that is, as this number goes up, satisfaction goes down, and some things are positively correlated. Surprising no one, satisfaction is in fact 100% correlated with itself. And so this is a useful analysis that an airline company might get someone to do. They might ask, where can we get our biggest bang for our buck to get customer satisfaction as high as possible? And down here, you'd see that, well, in-flight entertainment, you know, is 0.52 correlated with satisfaction. So if you had to boost something a little bit, and of course, uh, you know, this is not easy to say a little bit because our data is just one or zero. It doesn't take into account the quality of the entertainment, but it seems that if you don't have it, it's a pretty bad thing. Similarly, if you're trying to keep customers satisfied, you should probably avoid having delays in your arrival or your departure. That's pretty obvious, I would like to think. And then you get other things like ease of online booking, online support. Ah, oh, this definitely resonates with me. The number of times you go to one of the airline sites and you're trying to do something obvious, but it takes 400 clicks so you can't find, it's like, was this designed by a monkey? And if someone listening to this has designed an airline website, I'm sorry, that wasn't meant for you. It was meant for the other bad people. Okay, so the final thing that I thought it would be interesting to look at is something a little bit more complex. It's can we check if the online features have duplicate information? The reason I thought this would be interesting to look at is because if we have a look at the survey forms, there are a few different columns that represent online things. Ease of online booking, online support, and online boarding. Now, if you get a survey like this where, you know, questions seem to be very similar, a lot of users will simply just smack the same answer three times. No one has fun filling out a survey, so you go through it as quickly as possible. So we want to figure out, you know, are there correlations between the, the, the different answers that people have put in for the online category specifically? Now, there are a whole bunch of ways that we could approach this question, but I'm going to try and keep it really simple and just look at a normalized count of the responses that users have given when they've filled out these three different questions. So to do that, we're just going to pull out those three questions separately. That is, coming down here, I'm going to specify that our index is equal to the ease of online booking and also the online support and that the column that we're going to use is simply online boarding. Now, obviously you could swap this around, have two columns instead of uh, you know one and just have one in the index. It doesn't matter, the same data will be there as long as you have at least one of both, right? We're gonna pivot it, you need to have rows and columns. Specifically, we talked about how crosstab has normalization built in. However, we're not using crosstab. Uh, we could if we wanted to, but in this case, because I'm trying to normalize over every uh, index that we have, normalizing the entire array, it's simple for me to do. I just go P is equal to 100, so we're gonna do this in percent of P divided by P dot two underscore numpy dot sum. So p to numpy sum will simply give me the total number of entries in the entire data frame. And then by dividing by it and times it by 100, each column now represents the percentage of someone that's filled out that row. So I could run this now and have a look at what we get. And it's going to be some big, oh, I need to actually output p, don't I? Okay, so it's gonna be some thing here that's not that easy to read through. So let's make it easy. 
And the way that we'll do that is using the styles that we talked about all the way back in chapter two, data visualization. So we're gonna go p.style.background underscore gradient. And then we're gonna set the C map to, uh, you know, what would be good? Magma, yeah, that's that'd be work. And we're gonna go low is equal to zero. And then a high is equal to, let's say 1%. Otherwise, you know, there might be, oh, oh C mal. See map. Okay, let's go again. Great. Uh, so the reason we went to one is otherwise some of these values would mean that we wouldn't see anything else. They're just so far above the average value. But you can still see that we can now pull out what the significant values are very, very easily. And we can see here that there is extraordinary correlation between the results. So if we have a look at the cells that are bright, the cells that have everyone having filled out the same response, well, the cells that people have picked, you can see that here, online boarding, one, with an online support of one, in the ease of online booking, one, has by far and away the most results out of every combination that we can see. Similarly, if we look at number two, you can see that's correlated again with two, and two, and three, three, three. So it seems like the vast majority of people, if they pick three, or two, or one, or anything else in the online category for anyone, they're going to almost always give the same number to the other online categories. You can see there are some deviations here, especially around the higher number, four and fives. It's easier to go from a five down to a four than it is to go from a, you know, a one to a two. And that's simply because uh, humans are biased creatures. You've definitely seen this with Uber and Udemy, you know, course ratings, a good course, is 4.6, a bad course is 4.4. You know, it's it's very difficult to sort of tease that line. And that's why like places like Netflix now have thumbs up and thumbs down. So you can see there's more spread here in the higher number where people are more likely to not give a five because, you know, quote unquote, nothing's perfect. But down here, the correlations are super strong. They're still strong up here, of course, but there's a slight more variation and that's down to human psychology. And the point with all of this is simply that it's good to be aware of when you might have such strong correlations in here because it will affect how you treat your data. So for example, if you come up here, someone that isn't aware of that correlation might see all of this and go, oh look, ease of online booking, online support, online boarding. If we just make our webpage a little bit better, all of these will rise by 0.1 and we'll get like a 0.3 effect in the end and that's great. But it's like, well, no, they're all sort of tied together. So if you make your website better, they'll all go up, but they won't all go up independently. They'll all go up in the same way. So that's all I was trying to say in this section and I hope that makes sense. If there are still any further questions, feel free to leave me a message on the Q&A forum and we can discuss it further in a way that other students can see so that everyone can benefit from the discussion.